Wrestling Web. I'm joined by uh, Chris Tyson today, and we are so happy to be here with you today presenting a webinar for industrial manufacturing uh, organizations titled Five Common and Costly Industrial Website Mistakes to Drive Customers Away. Uh, we've had a lot of fun putting this together. Um, FlexPack is a client of SpinWeb, and we've worked closely with Chris, uh, who's the Director of Digital Communications there. And um, Chris had a great idea that we partnered together to put this together to present to our industrial manufacturing clients to help them kind of get a sense of uh, what to think about and what to watch out for when using their website as a marketing tool. So I uh, really appreciate that, Chris. So I'll introduce myself and then let Chris talk a little bit about his background, and then we'll get started. So a um, little bit about me. Um, my speaking site is michaelreynolds.com. I put a lot of resources there, and my uh, company site is spinweb.net. And I'm really easy to find on Twitter. Uh, I'm very active there. My Twitter handle is at Michael Reynolds. Um, I'm the CEO of Spinweb. I blog. I speak. I'm kind of a productivity nerd as well. So uh, those are things I like to talk about. And I speak for uh, various conferences around the country as well, as you can see there. And uh, fun fact about me, some hobbies of mine, I play tennis and I love sushi. So those who know me pretty well know that I'm a big sushi fan and I'm always uh, happy to meet up for lunch at a sushi place. So that is a little bit about me. I'm super easy to find. Uh, again, my contact information is there and I'll put it at the end on screen as well. But uh, send me a shout anytime. So uh, with that, I'll ask Chris to uh, jump in and tell you a little bit about himself as well. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Appreciate uh, putting this on today. Uh, as Michael said, I, I work for FlexPack. We're a SpinWeb client, and you'll see some screenshots of uh, the work SpinWeb's done for us later on. Um, you know, blogger, marketer, uh, all around online, social media, digital communications uh, nerd. Uh, you can see our company website up there at the top and my Twitter handle. If you uh, are so inclined to uh, send me a tweet, we'd love to interact with you there. A uh, little, little tidbit Michael put up there. I was uh, honorary command chief. Um, of the 4 and 34th up at Grissom Air Reserve Base. Got to do a lot of great behind-the-scenes thing and learn a lot about our, our military up there. So it's kind of a cool uh, cool little distinction I, I gained last year. Um, just a quick background on, on, on the actual webinar. Um, throughout my daily travels here at FlexPack, I get to visit uh, quite a few of our customers and prospects' websites and notice the theme of a lot of antiquated uh, um, websites and web presences that didn't really match um, the company from, from the other standpoint of I knew what they did. Um, so, you know, they, they just need to get a little bit more updated, a little bit more at the times, and it's not a, a very daunting task. And a website scare people and they sound really expensive and it's a, you know, it's a big bad thing to, to some of these industrial or manufacturing companies that think because they don't have an e-commerce solution, they don't need a new website. And we're going to kind of give you some insights on, on why we feel, um, you know, new new web presences are important and give you some background on what SpinWeb has done for us and, and some of the gains that we've seen from our new website. Great. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, like Chris mentioned, we're super excited to be here. And um, one thing that uh, we specialize in at SpinWeb is websites for manufacturing and industrial clients. We have a, a number of uh, great organizations in those industries, and we've really uh, enjoyed helping them. Uh, with their websites and marketing efforts, and so that is a specialty of ours. So um, we also love questions, both of us. So uh, don't be shy about asking questions throughout the presentation. Uh, you're welcome to wait till the end if you want to kind of store them up. But I also love questions throughout. So if we hit on a topic that you'd like to, uh, you know, touch on a bit more, or dig deeper, or just kind of follow up with a question on, uh, go ahead and pop them in the question box. Um, Chris and I are both going to monitor that, and we will bring those up as we go. If you type them in there, and we'd love to address any questions you have along the way. So, so with that, um, let's go ahead and kick things off here. Uh, first off, I, I wanted to display the, the FlexPack website here. Uh, it's at flexp.com. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we designed this. We uh, really are very quite proud of it. Um, you know, Chris is hopefully quite proud of it as well. He's uh, given us great feedback, and, uh, and he's going to tell some stories a little bit later on here along the way about um, you know, each topic, I'm going to ask Chris to kind of jump in with his story uh, from FlexPack as well. Uh, but let's kind of just first start off the, the conversation with understanding that your website uh, for your company is home base. And the reason I say home base um, is really because um, we have a lot of tools at our disposal today, a lot of networks, a lot of resources. We have social media. There's, you know, so many different networks available online and social media. We have blogs. We have articles. We have video. We have 
uh, micro networks like uh, Vine and Instagram that are kind of focused on just photo or video. We have so many different ways to communicate. And so a lot of people kind of get confused. Um, a lot of marketers within these uh, organizations kind of think, where do I start? What do I do? What am I, what am I supposed to do? What's my marketing strategy look like with all these tools? Really, uh, your website is, is your home base for everything about your company. And I like to think of all those other tools as outposts. Those are really kind of splash points and satellite outposts where you can develop communities and develop conversations. And then the idea is that you want to point people always back to your home base at some point, whether it's initially or whether it's, you know, five touches down the road. At some point, you want to bring them back to your home base where the real questions get answered and where the real transactions happen, whether it's picking up the phone and calling or filling out a form or doing research. That really happens on your home base. So it's awesome to use outposts like social media um, as kind of satellite entities to develop communities, but you want to always think of that hub uh, as your website. Your website is that home base, that hub where, where all the action happens. So let's jump to what I call mistake number one. And mistake might be kind of a harsh word, but uh, I, I do think of them as, as high priority. So I do think is a, it's a mistake to ignore these things. And one of those things is uh, underestimating the importance of design. Um, I see, and Chris has shared this with me as well, that we both see a lot of industrial websites that um, they may function well, they may have the right tools, but they are lacking in design. And some people say, well, why does that matter? You know, we just want to kind of, you know, offer the right information and we're done. Um, it really does matter, and there's data supporting this. Um, you know, some of the data points to the amount of time that people spend making snap judgments about a site's overall appearance. And really it's about 50 milliseconds. So that is a just a spark, just a real quick snapshot of how long it takes to uh, to kind of immediately judge um, how aesthetically pleasing and credible a website is. So um, that's really not a lot of time. It's really, you know, as soon as they view it, it it's over. That, they've already made their decision. And wh why that matters is that it really affects how your audience views your organization. Uh, for example, a lot of people look at a, the aesthetics of a website and they say, well, if the site is not professionally designed, it's not well crafted, it doesn't look like it's um, really well put together or really much investment made in the craftsmanship of it, what else is this company skimping on? Are they skimping on customer privacy? Are they skimping on security? Are they skimping on quality of product? Those questions start to come up in your audience's mind. And so this is why design is a really high priority um, you know, things like uh, quality of photography, things like uh, well-planned layout, uh, things like current modern design practices. Uh, these all really affect credibility of your organization. Uh, whether you're seeing it or not, people are, are viewing you that way. So um, with that, I want to kind of um, pass it back to Chris uh, briefly just to kind of touch on his story. Um, he actually wrote a couple of guest posts for us at SpinWeb, and both of those guest blogs really touched on some experiences he had with design credibility and how it supported his sales team, um, both before and after the redesign of his website. So, Chris, I'd love to hear uh, your feedback on how design has, has affected FlexPack. Sure. Um, so, as you can see, this is our, our updated website um, that we have done through SpinWeb. Um, and I wish I had a screenshot, but we don't of, of our of our previous site. But it was fairly typical of an older industrial company. You know, we're in we're in distribution, so it, we're in the same space. And it was, you know, like Mike Michael would call it, kind of a brochure site. It had some information. You could contact us. Had some email addresses. So it it served its purpose from a communication standpoint, but it didn't really match who we were from a messaging standpoint, and didn't really give the grand scope of of what our company is and and our size and and capabilities. Uh, and I found that out firsthand. Um, we have a location up in Elkhart, Indiana, and I was speaking with one of our sales reps up there about a lead that I had um, received through just actually a personal referral. And he said, "Yeah, actually, I've been in there. I've been in there before, before you started here, and they wouldn't talk to me." And I said, "Well, you know, if you don't mind me asking, why why wouldn't they even deal with you?" And he said, "Well, he said it's funny you should ask. He said they told me that they went out online and did some research on us and." They went to our website, and they, it didn't look like uh, our company was legitimate or big enough to handle their needs based on uh, what they saw on our website. And even being in the industry of you know digital communications and web marketing, that floored me. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that. You know, it's always 
been told, you know, content is king and content, you know, as you'll find out later with uh, search engines is a big factor, but um, just the forward-facing design of the site turned the customer off, uh, the, actually the prospect off enough that they wouldn't even allow our sales rep into their facility to have a discussion with them about their needs. So even if we could have assisted them and improved their business, uh, they didn't even get to that point with us because they automatically discounted us. Um, their international headquarters were up in Elk Harp, uh, and right down the street from us. So they were a big international company, and they were used to dealing with, you know, a certain a certain type and size of company. And to them, our web presence made us look like we were, you know, mom and pop shop. You know, you, you see those kind of places in the distribution industry where they don't even have, you know, web. They don't have a warehouse. They might just drop ship product, and it's just one guy working out of his house. So they were very concerned about our capabilities to handle their account and wouldn't let our sales rep in. So, you know, it doesn't matter how good your services are, how good your products are, how good your sales staff even is, you you might not even be able to get that feedback from the customer. You might just not hear from them again. At least luckily in our instance, we were able to get that feedback from the customer. So we, you know, we knew we needed some improvement and definitely helped us um, with our redesign. But a lot of times you won't even hear from the customer again, and you won't know why. And there is a, a decent possibility that your web presence, whether it's from, you know, the content or in this case the design and the layout, uh, is, is causing you opportunities that leads in customers. Thanks, Rich. I love that story because it uh, kind of reinforces what I uh, often tell people. They have, you have questions like that, like, hey, does it really matter? Well, stories like that really, really prove that it matters. So I appreciate that, Chris. Thank you, and uh, appreciate those. Sure articles he wrote for us uh, telling that story as well. Um, so let's go to mistake number two, which is ignoring content. And content covers a lot. Content covers um, just basic web content, you know, about us pages, what we do, services, products, things like that. It covers, you know, product descriptions. It covers learning guides and materials for distributors and end users. It covers articles, press releases, blogs. Uh, content is hyper important and a lot of people ignore it because it's difficult. Content is not easy to keep up with. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes uh, skill to write well. So uh, content is really important. And what I see a lot still, uh, Chris and I both see this a lot, um, is brochure sites. The brochure site is kind of the 10 years ago or 15 years ago even uh, website where it's like, oh, okay, we're going to take our business card and our brochures and are basically going to place it online. We're going to put the About Us page our logo, maybe a couple of photos, uh, some services, what we do, contact information, and call it a day. And that's really your brochure site. Now, is it better than nothing at all? Yeah, if it looks good, it's probably better than nothing at all, sure. But that's really not, um, not going to cut up these days. It really takes more than that to engage your prospects and your customers. The brochure site is really not terribly useful to anyone anymore. So you want to make sure that there is good content that is fresh, that is well-maintained, and that is targeted and strategic. Strategic content, we'll get to here in just a moment. Um, those are things like blogs, like uh, well-crafted press releases, like ebooks, downloadable material. Well-crafted content really engages people and, and promotes a transaction. And really the transaction is what you want to go for. You can't transact with a brochure. Uh, with a website, you can and should be transacting in some way. So as you prepare the content, uh, a couple of rules of thumb to watch out for. Um, this is more how you write content, more text on the screen. Um, you want to avoid big blocks of text. You want to make sure that it's short, simple, to the point. Um, you don't drown people in too much text. They just won't read it. So make sure paragraphs are broken up. Um, a lot of times, especially in technical industries, you know, manufacturing, industrial, a lot of our technical organizations that we work with, they, they get really hung up on all the information they think they have to convey when really um, just a small subset of that will often do and really get the point across. And you can always offer more information as a download in some of their context. But too much content sometimes uh, will overwhelm people and they will, they will not do what you want them to do, which is actually read it. So we want to think of, uh, we actually want to take a cue from an older industry here, which is newspapers, and uh, really kind of remember how um, they write in that industry and really learn from that. And that's the inverted pyramid. Um, you know, things like uh, subheads that break up text, use bulleted lists to help people scan, highlight keywords, uh, make sure the most important information is at the top, that's the inverted pyramid. That way they can quickly scan the first few lines and get the gist of it without having to read the entire article. Some people won't. Um, use a very simple writing style, something very conversational. Um, 
Also, it's really important to um, kind of purge your content of marketing speak. I'm sure a lot of you have seen websites where there's tons of marketing speak or industry speak or technical speak, and you know you look kind of like this poor kid here is trying to figure out what the heck these people are saying. You know, these this kind of marketing speak where it's talking over people's heads, it's using industry jargon, uh, it's not really conversational. It's it's way too thick, and we want to avoid this kind of uh, this kind of tone. We want to be very conversational, very simple and very direct. Now when it comes to the type of content you want to produce, obviously the basics are uh, informational content on your website, product services about, company information, those are all bare minimum. But really going deeper um, is looking at how you can use content more strategically. And one of the best ways to do that is with a corporate blog. And a corporate blog is, uh, if you're not familiar with blogging, it is an engine of articles. I say engine because it's kind of an always running kind of thing. Um, it's a repository of articles that are educational and very uh, oriented toward teaching your audience. What a lot of people do is they make the mistake of thinking, oh, I've got a blog. I can now dump my press releases there. Or I can now just kind of promote my stuff there or my events. That's really the wrong use of a blog. A blog is more about putting your teaching hat on and your kind of professor hat and saying, okay, what can I teach my audience that they might be asking every day. That they might be asking us. They might be asking our competitors. They might be asking just in general looking for answers somewhere. And these are things you can really teach your audience that will help them, um, for one thing, become more loyal to you because you're giving them solutions, and two, stay on your website. Now, beyond that, Google loves blogs. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, we see amazing results from regular blogging uh, with our clients and our company as well. Uh, when we blog on a regular basis, when our clients blog, when they produce great content that is focused on answering questions for their audience. Again, not promoting, but answering questions. Um, another nice thing about blogs are they're really good fuel for social media. Oftentimes, um, our clients will look at social media and, and social networks and say, well, gosh, what do I do? I want to get started. I'm going to start just kind of asking, asking questions, maybe just talking to people, and that's great but they really don't see a relationship between what they're doing on social media and lead generation. And so what blogging does is it really gives you fuel to have something to talk about on social media. So if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or Google Plus or Twitter, and you instead of just kind of chattering and saying random things, you actually have an article to talk about or an article to post and ask questions about or ask for feedback on or a video embedded within a blog post that says, hey, now share this with your network because it can teach you a concept that we know a lot of our customers are struggling with. That gives you some really great fuel behind your social media efforts, and suddenly you don't have to think about it as much because you now just have great stuff to talk about. And social media then becomes a communication medium as opposed to a scary tactic. So again, I cannot stress blogging enough. Regular blogging, for example, once a week minimum, is a great way to improve your search engine rankings and give you fuel for social media and become closer to your customers. And HubSpot gives us some nice data here. Um, they do a lot of studies on this stuff, and um, some of their studies point to some of these metrics which are really interesting. One is that companies that blog typically get 55% more website visitors than those who don't, so website traffic is very positively affected by blogging. In their studies, 57% of their businesses in that pool acquired a customer through their company blog. And I want to kind of pause here and tell a personal story as well because earlier this week even, um, I work with a consulting client who's an engineering firm and we're getting them started with a blogging program. And they've been blogging for literally 45 days, not that long. They've got maybe 10 blogs posted. They came in this week and when I was working with them, they said, hey, we were so excited. We have a story to tell you. We got seven new customers from our latest blog post. It kind of blew my mind. I was like, seven new customers? That's amazing. And they're like, yeah, we wrote this post. It was really well thought out. It was well written. It really solved problems and educated. And we sent it to our, our mailing list. And they acquired seven new customers who were kind of on the fence and were, you know, they were ready to do something once they got some kind of, you know, prompting or some kind of contact to kind of move the needle for them. And that blog post was enough to either lower risk enough or answer enough questions. And they contacted our client and and got the ball rolling, and they now have seven new clients from that blog post. Now, will that happen every time? No, of course not. That's a really kind of unique story, but things like that happen on a regular basis when you really commit to a blogging program. Also, in the B2B space, um, companies that 
blog generate typically 67% more leads than those who don't. So this makes your sales team very happy typically. Uh, when your sales team can increase the amount of inbound leads or the size of the database they can talk to, that really makes their job easier. So your sales team will be smiling when you do things like implement a blogging program to help make their job easier and set them up for success. Now, of course, to do all this, you need a content management system. So I'm going to take a little uh, slight detour here and just uh, remind you that if your website is not running on a content management system, um, then that's something to really look at and really make a high priority. And a content management system, or CMS for short, is a software app, typically web-based, that lets you manage content, post blogs on a regular basis, keep content up to date using only a web browser with no technical knowledge. So that's really something that's to make a high priority as well. I'd like to, uh, again, kind of, kind of throw it to Chris here for just a minute and uh, let him tell you um, what kind of success he's had at Flexpack uh, with a blogging program. And I've put a screenshot on here that shows kind of a range of dates. And I'll let Chris talk about what's happened. Uh, this is actually a pretty, a pretty great story as well. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So this is, as you can see, from when our um, website launched um, back in, I believe, it, uh, April uh, up, until, up until now. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the arc of traffic uh, held, held fairly steady. And as you can see, um, this, this date starts from when our website was launched because prior to uh, my arrival here, we did not have Google Analytics installed on our site, so I don't have any historical um, data to share, you know, new website, you know, more content versus old, but um, I, I can assure you it's blowing out of the water what the current traffic or the past traffic used to be. Um, so as you can see, you know, as we started, we, we published some content um, to get going and we're, you know, 700, 800 visits a month to a, uh, to a site that did not get a whole lot of traffic, didn't have a lot of updated content. Um, hadn't hadn't been around for a long time. It didn't have a big user base or a, or a following or anything where we were um, pull, pulling in people from. Um, so this is all basically new new traffic, all generated from updating uh, content and having a website that we can update content on. Uh, you'll see a slight dip. Um, let's see, yeah, it's probably about November December um, of last year, and we were actually. It's interesting that there was a dip there. Um, we were in the middle of a project of, uh, of trying to get a CRM together, and so we were doing lots of work um, internally uh, on digital communications, but not externally from a content standpoint. So we weren't updating our, our news section on our website. We weren't updating our expert advice blog on our website, and as you can see, there's a slight dip. Um, after, after the first of the year, notice you know, the, con the, the traffic was still kind of holding steady or, or declining and really made a concerted effort to update the site more. Um, as Michael had said earlier, you know, a, a blog isn't just for pushing promotions or products and, and and even for, you know, announcing this webinar today, we have a separate section that is just a, a news articles section. So to announce this, we, we posted the content in that news article um, section. So as far as Google is concerned or other search engines, they see new content and new text on the page and that helps us um, get better indexed and, and get more traffic. So it doesn't have to be just a blog, but, but we definitely get a lot more traction to our blog posts as opposed to our news articles because our blog posts are structured to, to really, like Michael said, solve problems and answer questions. So we try to, you know, title the content in that way and really gear, gear the, the content of the blog post towards problem solving and question answering. Um, and as we started doing more of that, you could see the traffic has just continued to rise and um, you know, as you said earlier, you know, content and blogging is, is not easy. Um, the content may be living in your brain or you might have product experts on staff, but really structuring that in a way that it's easy for the reader to understand, answers their problems, and also uh, looks good for a search engine. Uh, it, it can be kind of difficult and, you know, we definitely don't post as much content as we would like because I, that falls um, entirely with me and I'm a staff of one on the content side which I'm sure most of, uh, most of your companies are either don't have a marketing team or if you do, it's, it's also the sales manager who's head of sales and marketing. So um, e even just a little bit of content that I can do uh, on an individual standpoint, you can see there from the traffic has led to um, almost double the website traffic per month just with the one person team. So this isn't 
a blog or content that's managed by a company. We're not paying lots of money to have this done. This is just using our internal resources um, and our internal staff of, of one to, to really generate double the traffic in, in little over a year um, from where we started. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. I love seeing those graphs go up and up. So whenever we see uh, one of our clients with this kind of data, it uh, makes us really smile. So I love the fact that it's, it's literally doubled over the course of a year. And that's pretty, pretty normal. Usually six months to 12 months is a good time frame to kind of measure the success of your blogging program. And so this is actually very, uh, very much in line with what we typically see. So doubling in traffic is definitely what I call success, and it's still going up. So thanks, Chris. That's great stuff. Sure. All right. So let's go to uh, mistake number three, which is lack of a call to action. So what do I mean by, by calls to action? Let's take a look at what um, some of our clients are doing. And calls to actions are things like um, joining a meeting, signing up for a blog or a newsletter, uh, subscribing to a seminar or downloading something. Uh, these are all things that give your viewers or your audience something to do. Even that search box at the top can be considered a call to action. What I see in a lot of kind of the old school brochure sites that I've referenced before um, is a real lack of call to action. It's kind of putting up a wall between your visitor and some kind of transaction or some kind of contact with your company. Obviously, all of us should want contact with prospects. We want to talk to them. We want to help them answer questions. We want to really engage in a relationship that will hopefully lead to business support. That's our goal. So if we don't give our visitors logical paths to reach that goal, uh, they're going to go elsewhere. And so FlexPact does a really good job of this as well. They have um, on every single page, I believe, every single page has a call to action, actually two calls to action that give you a couple options. One is um, get personalized expert advice, and that I believe leads to the blog, which is awesome. And then two, schedule a free needs analysis. Um, every page you're on uh, gives you that nice little call to action that says, you know what, if I'm ready, I'm going to click that beautiful little orange icon and say schedule a free needs analysis. It's free, it's easy, it's right there. It's not in my face, it's not obtrusive, it's not interrupting me, but it's just kind of hovering there, ready to be of service. And that's really a good use of the call to action. So I love what they're doing here. So, and this is actually on one of the blog posts. Um, this is a FlexPack blog post on uh, three ways to improve your facility during winter. Again, very educational, very on topic. And then there's that call to action right there. And I know for a fact they get conversions from that. Also, um, another one of our clients, um, has calls to action at the end of the blog post, which is a great place to put them. So whenever you publish a new blog post, um, you want to think about putting a call to action that is relevant and related to that topic at the end. So when someone's finished reading it, they have a next step. What a lot of people do is they kind of um, stop with the blog and just kind of do part of the program, but they don't really give anyone you know, any place to go after that. So you read the blog and you're done, you're happy, and you go on about your business. But instead, if you place a call to action at the end, you can generate a conversion. And a conversion in this case is downloading this ebook on filter types and locations. And what that does is that builds your database. Because when someone downloads the ebook, they fill out their email address and contact information, and you're building your database. And then later, if they come back and download more things or visit more parts of your website, you can actually build a profile on that person, and you can see the uh, timeline, what they're doing, and how engaged they are, and even score them. And that's you know a lot of stuff you can do once you start building data on people like that. So think about how you can place calls to action strategically in your blog post and throughout your site to invite that conversion. And again, like I said, I know for a fact that uh, FlexPack has seen um, results from this, so uh, I'd love to have Chris tell us how, um, you know, what kinds of calls to actions lead to successful uh, lead generation on the FlexPack website. Sure. So, you know, as Michael had said, we have a couple different calls to action built right into, uh, right into the website that we can an update if we choose but they are contained on every page. Also, you see there at the top in the header, we have um, three calls to action with not only our, our phone number, um, but a link to our product catalog, and then also that, that search bar where um, it really helps the, the, you know, the user get to some information if they are having trouble you know, finding it otherwise. Uh, you can see what's, what's up here on the screen now is our uh, contact form. So we, you know, we get this used from everything uh, for people trying to get you know, directions for shipment deliveries all the way to that needs analysis or um, quoting options. So you know, people we've had uh, fill out that form asking for pricing on items after they've read a post about you know, something that um, solved a problem for them. 
Uh, we also have more recently kind of taken a, a little bit of the approach that Michael had shown in that sec second example of at the end of an article or even at the end of a, at the end of a web page of doing some real calls to action within the content there at the at bottom of the screen. So we, we've done some, some stuff with the uh, content management system that we use um, that SpinWeb built for us that, that has some different colored buttons that, that match our branding, so our blues, our greens, and our oranges. And we've really been able to direct some traffic to either external sources, um, like some online proposals that we have, or also some, some sign-up forms, um, like we did for, for this webinar, or even some um, links out to our product catalog, where before we used to have what, you know, in, in the manufacturing industrial industry would be called a line card. Um, you know, you're used to having a either a, an actual physical piece of paper that has all your products listed, or even on more of a brochure website, uh, they treat, you know, line cards as kind of their product section. Uh, and, and we had something similar, but we've now really taken the approach of, of going one step farther and really linking out to each subcategory, subsection of our web catalog, and we've seen an enormous increase in traffic to that web catalog since we've uh, installed that. So instead of making people find our, our products or our content or really doing the work themselves, we're trying to take every barrier out. So, you know, like I said, calls to action of phone numbers, buttons, links, you know, just really giving them the option of, of having that next step open to them and easily accessible. Awesome. And one thing you'll also notice about the FlexPack website, which I love, is that it's so clean and simple. Um, and this is actually foreshadowing to our uh, our next uh, topic here, which is uh, usability planning. But you'll, you'll notice the simplicity, which really kind of highlights, you know, that orange button, that that form, the call to action on the sidebar. Those are all very uh, prominent because nothing else is competing for attention. So it's very well balanced. And and like I said, that's kind of our nice segue to mistake number four, which is lack of usability planning. And usability is really the concept of making sure that your visitors can actually get around on your site quickly before they lose interest or, or lose uh, their attention span kind of runs out. And uh, one of my favorite uh, usability experts is Jacob Nielsen. He does a lot of research, I mean a ton of research. He is the master of usability research. So if you want to look up Jacob Nielsen, um, he's got a ton of material on usability. And he advises us uh, that if, uh, it's a pretty famous quote actually, if everything is equally prominent, then nothing is prominent. Uh, it's our job to advise the user, to guide them, and to gently nurture them toward the most promising choices, while also ensuring their freedom, so they can go wherever they want to as well. So this is really a, uh, a guiding principle behind all of our designs, is to make sure that we don't make the mistake of making sure everything is prominent, because at that point, everything's competing equally, and nothing is prominent. And we see this a lot with um, you know, committees or lots of people that kind of get involved and they say, oh, my stuff's really important or my department wants this or my department wants that and suddenly you have a home page on your website that is full of like 25 different priorities and your poor website visitor has no idea where to go and they get confused and they have a bad experience and you've lost them at that point. So you really want to make sure that you uh, whittle down those priorities into the bare essence of what you want your uh, visitors to do, what the highest priorities are and make sure that you have a nice cascading hierarchy of options. That's really because time online is super compressed. Um, our attention spans online are incredibly short. And there's some um, there's some data here actually that um, kind of points to, you know, g gives us some insight into some of those uh, specific activities and what those time frames are. Um, less than a second, that's the time needed for someone to decide on the visual appeal of your website. We talked about that at the very beginning when we talked about design. Less than a second. That's all it takes for someone to say, hey, this site is credible or it's not. One second is really the maximum amount of time a visitor will give you before they give up on um, you know, controls of a website, basically clicking a menu and waiting for a button to respond or waiting for a form to complete or waiting for some action to complete. So they start to feel a lack of control if a website element doesn't respond within one second. So that's good. Um, a good argument to make sure that your code is clean, that your site is well structured, loads quickly, uh, people can navigate it very easily, not you know big cumbersome drop down menus everywhere. Uh, you want to make sure it's very easy to to get responsive feedback from elements on your site. Ten seconds is really how much time people are going to give you on a particular page before they give up and say, you know what, I'm I'm done with this section. It's not serving my need. It's bad. I'm out of here. Uh, again, not much time. Now, when it comes to longer transactions, like filling out a form, for example, on a website, 
if it takes them longer than a minute to do this, uh, they're most likely going to abandon it. And uh, one minute is actually pretty generous. I've seen people give up after like 10 seconds. But this is a thing like a contact form, an application form, a need assessment form. Um, you know, banks are horrible about this. They give you these huge forms that you have to fill out to make an application, and you just want to give up and just walk into a branch because you're just tired of filling it out. So you want to think of what is the bare minimum it, um, information that you can ask somebody for um, to kind of start the process. So rather than ask somebody for a huge needs analysis kind of thing, you know, ask for the basics. They tell me about your needs on a very basic level, and let's take the next step to a personal conversation or a phone call or maybe a follow-up email. So um, keep that one-minute rule in mind when you're thinking of application forms or any kind of uh, transactional tool on your website. Now, overall, um, the average um, time spent on a B2B website is about seven minutes. So you want to make sure that you understand that people don't spend all day on your website. As much as you'd love them to, they have other priorities. So you really have to make sure that you serve their needs in an extremely short amount of time. Uh, again, seven minutes is the average, sometimes more, sometimes less. But if someone's doing research, they're not going to give you a whole lot of time. So that's a, a, a real priority. You want to make sure you get them to that path very quickly. And again, going back to kind of priorities, um, a good way to make sure all these things fall into place is make sure that you avoid too many competing priorities. You want to make sure that you don't cram everything on the home page. You want to make sure that you really keep a simple, elegant design and layout in mind as you build your website. Now, Chris, I'm sure you've had some uh, success stories from before and after when it comes to usability because I know your previous website had some usability issues. So what have you seen um, in terms of before and after uh, with your, your old and your new website? Yeah, well, one of the main uh, one of the main pieces of feedback that we receive from from customers, uh, vendors, and basically anybody that that we've that we've talked to or that has approached us and, and mentioned the new site has been the, you know, the usability and the layout. Uh, we get constant feedback on, hey, that's that was really easy to use. You know, we really appreciate that website because you know in our in our industry and in industrial and manufacturing distribution, um, you know, web websites are are fairly antiquated. So they're not used to having a website that's fairly easy to navigate and get to the, like you said, you know, get to the information quickly and easily because people are, are busy and just they're they're trying to get to what they need and they don't want to, you know, spend a lot of time to do it. Uh, even our sales staff quite often will will come back um, to myself and come back to our team with with feedback from their customers that they've seen out in the field that, you know, they really appreciate the site and how easy it is to navigate. Um, you know, as you can see, we've really put a lot of the main key pieces of information in a very accessible place. You know, our, our uh, contact uh, form, our phone number, um, you can very quickly and easily get a hold of somebody and, and get information. The, the buttons and, and the menu and the navigation is, is all very large text. It's all very clean, as Michael said, um, and, and, and kind of to his point of, of not cramming stuff onto a page and and having different departments involved, you know, luckily um, I was able to kind of own the project when we launched this website. Um, so I was able to work directly with SpinWeb and and allowed them to give me their input. And I was kind of the main contact person. We we definitely you know doubled back with our executive team on some major decisions and and some tweaks to the site, but we weren't hammered down by um, you know committee meetings of of multiple people or multiple divisions. Uh, it was allowed to kind of be owned by myself and then just really consult with the rest of the team. So it allowed us to not have too many hands in there and, and really muddy, muddy up the, the design of the site. So that's been my, from my standpoint, that's been my favorite part um, of the website redesign has been the usability because, you know, coming from uh, online marketing world and, and, you know, testing out different sites and, and being out there on the web all day long, um, you know, cluttered sites that, that don't have easy usability are, are one of my huge pet peeves. So. Obviously, if it's uh, something that bothers me, it's something that I know other users um, will get bothered by as well. So we've really been um, proud of the usability and the layout of our site so far. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And um, that brings us actually to mistake number five, which is ignoring mobile. Um, mobile is, uh, I can't stress how important this is, uh, especially now and, and from here on out. Um, everyone has a smartphone pretty much. Everyone has mobile devices, tablets, Androids, Windows phones, 
a lot of people now are using mobile devices to do the same thing that they previously did on a desktop or a laptop. And so um, ignoring mobile is, um, is a pretty big deal to me. It's kind of at your peril, I say, because uh, a lot of people really are, are looking for information on a mobile device, and if they don't find it very quickly, um, they're going to move on to the next site or the next resource. And so I kind of like to, you know, kind of jokingly, I don't know if anyone who watches SNL and kind of the Seth and Amy skits where they go, really? This is what I say to people when they say, oh, no mobile site? You know, we don't have one yet. I'm like, really? You've got to get on this. You really have to get on a mobile site, uh, like now, like this year. Um, and here's why. I, I take some cues here from Facebook, and this is only one social network, but they've chosen to reveal some of their data, and so they've given us some really good insight into what's happening on social networks. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I'm sure you know who Mark Zuckerberg is, revealed that in 2012, more people are using Facebook on mobile than on desktop. So I'll let that sink in for just a minute. So what does that mean to you when it comes to traffic to your website? Well, what that means is that potentially um, a good portion, maybe even half or more of your website traffic coming from social networks could be on a mobile device. Um, that's important because uh, not just Facebook, but LinkedIn has great mobile uh, apps and great mobile website, Twitter is mobile, all these social networks have very well optimized mobile experiences. And if you're blogging and sharing content on a regular basis, ideally you want to publish that through social media as well. That also helps. And so when that happens, you bring people back to your website, and if they jump from a very comfortable mobile experience to a very uncomfortable non-mobile optimized experience, you've damaged your brand, you've jarred their experience, you're causing them to potentially leave and not go any further. Uh, you've really kind of put up a wall at that point where you could have had a transaction. You could have had a download, a phone call, an engagement of some sort, a subscription. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. So um, the shift is now. The shift is happening now. It's happened uh, toward mobile. And I also um, took a look at, uh, with Chris's help, I took a look at FlexPak's uh, Google Analytics here for the past month. A month is a good snapshot to kind of see what's going on in current data. And literally half their mobile their traffic is on mobile. So half the traffic that comes to the FlexPak website is from a mobile device, 50%. And you might want to check out your mobile stats as well when you go into Google Analytics. Um, go to your mobile section and check out how much of your traffic is mobile versus desktop, and you may be surprised. Um, so that is something I like to point out is, is how to look at that and how to kind of see what's happening in your analytics. And as you can see with FlexPak, it's half and half right now. So a lot of traffic comes from mobile. So when you look at the mobile context, um, you really want to understand how people react to information. First of all, they want it quickly, which on the web, it's, you know, our attention spans are very short anyway. On mobile, it's that much shorter. It is incredibly short. Um, burden of value is going to be higher as a result. Uh, you're going to have to have more of a burden to really prove that you have something of value to offer the mobile website visitor. People tend to not do a lot of what I call real work, but lots of consumption. So they're not going to, you know, do a lot of typing, a lot of, uh, you know, some people will purchase products via mobile, but not as often. They're not very transaction heavy in terms of real work, um, but they do do lots of consumption and basic button clicking. So they will fill out short forms. They will click buttons. They will do click to call. They'll read lots of stuff. They'll watch videos. They consume lots of information. So you want to think about that and use that to your advantage. Um, they will take, and again, they will take a path to a call to action as long as it's short and simple. I also want to highlight another one of our manufacturing clients, which is Muncie Power Products. Um, we built a mobile site for them, which highlights a lot of the best practices I like to kind of help with. And, and one of those things is, you know, make sure it's uh, bigger content. Uh, as you can see, this is very well mobile optimized because it's a single column format. You don't have to zoom around and pinch and scroll to kind of get content. You can just see it immediately on the screen. And you can scroll up and down to get what you need. Also, product imagery, big and bold. On mobile, you want to make sure you use that limited screen space to show big, bold product imagery, show detail. That's a really beautiful photo of that particular piece of machinery. You want to highlight that and make sure all the details there. Also, click to call is super important. On the left-hand screen, you can see that at the bottom of every single page on mobile, um, the 800 number is very prominent, very easy to find. You can click it to call it. Um, it's a very quick path uh, to that phone call. And these are what I call bridges. On mobile, people often look for a bridge. You know, again, they're not going to do a lot of, you know, quote, real work and a lot of heavy transactional stuff. 
but instead they're going to look for a bridge to the next step in their process. And a frequent bridge is a phone call. You know, they're looking up a phone number, they want to do some really basic research, and then they want to call because they've got their phone in their hand already and they're ready to talk to someone. They want to call up, find a sales rep, ask a question. Don't hide that phone number because that's a wall you're putting up once you do that. Make that phone number prominent, easy to find. That should be the most prominent thing in your mobile site, quite honestly. And on the right-hand side, you also see the um, – this is the distributor section, and it's got really quick access to reference material. Again, big, bold buttons, very prominent, top of the screen. Everything else gets out of the way. You're stripping away all the excess stuff that you don't need on mobile because people are very quick to pinpoint that one thing they need and to go straight for it. If they don't find it, they're done. So, again, one more time, I want to um, – touch on uh, Chris's success with uh, his mobile website as well and kind of see um, see what kind of success he's had. Sure. And Michael, we've got a, a question that's actually perfect to uh, lead into to my portion oh, of the great. Bit, and it's from, it's from Julie. Um, and Julie asked, you know, one, she said, wondering if you considered responsive web design and the Flexpack site development process. Um, and, and I'll oh, kind of tackle question. that. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'll kind of tackle that first um, because you know, responsive web design is, is a definite hot button topic right now, and it's something that that I enjoy greatly when I'm um, navigating sites on my own. Um, we definitely considered and, and discussed it from from the onset, um, Julie, when we were speaking with with Josh and Michael and everybody at SpinWeb from a uh, from our blueprinting standpoint. Uh, we we didn't actually um, go with a full responsive website from the start, um, just due to our budget constraints on that. But we definitely knew that um, that mobile optimization was something we wanted to do, but we weren't entirely sure with our audience how much uh, mobile traffic we would get, just because we didn't have any any um, historical data on on how much mobile traffic we would receive. Uh, and, and us being in you know industrial manufacturing sector, uh, we were taking kind of the approach that a lot of our people would would be accessing it from their desk. And they probably wouldn't have cell phones out, you know, on the plant floor in the distribution facility floor, um, as much as, as the, you know, we're, we're talking more to the the C level and the executives and some of the operations people at, at the plant. So we were we were kind of taking the approach of we don't we're not really sure on how much mobile traffic we're going to get, so we're going to um, keep it out of the initial design, but but definitely keep it in play. So what we what we did was um, went with through a third party provider. And, and created what you can see there on the screen, um, and, and have just been amazed by the amount of mobile traffic that we've gotten. Um, as, as Michael showed you there, we have you know half of our traffic is mobile. Um, those click-to-call buttons have gotten a ton of use. Uh, we actually right below that screenshot there, um, our actual um, Google Map buttons, so you can actually you know get driving directions right from your phone um, if if need be. So we've been pleasantly surprised with the amount of uh, mobile traffic we've gotten, and also now that we've gotten into the amount of work it's taken us to do a mobile website um, or a mobile version of our site through a, through a separate um, third-party vendor, um, the amount of time that I put into it, we're definitely um, considering changing some of the back-end structure of, of the main website to make it um, more responsive. And for those of you that don't understand or aren't aware of what responsive web design is, Basically, what it allows you to do is have one website, and instead of doing what they call a redirect, so right now what you see on your screen, um, it pops up when you when you visit our site from a phone or a tablet. Um, the website recognizes that you're on a, a screen that's a smaller size, and it says, hey, show them this version of the website. So it actually pulls up a separate version from that third-party vendor and gives them that content. Um, so that's not as good from a... Um, search engine optimization standpoint, but it's good that it gives our our people the you know the proper information that they need quickly and easily. Um, but but with the responsive website is it'll actually return a different version of the of your actual site without having to go out to a third party or redirect. So it'll take the navigation on our main site and instead of having it go horizontal across the screen, it'll recognize the screen is smaller and it'll make it go um, vertical. And it will, you know, crop everything to fit the phone basically is, or the tablet is what it will do. So that's kind of the background of responsive design. So great, great question, Julian. We definitely considered it up front and we're kind of took the approach of we'll wait to see what the what the stats tell us before we go down that um, 
down that front. So I don't know, if Michael, if you have anything to add on that front at all. No, you covered it very well. Um, we all, all of our new websites we're building now are fully responsive. It's just kind of baked into the whole process, so it, it's sort of non-negotiable. So we just say, you know, hey, if we're building a website, it's going to be responsive out of the box. So that's really the future. Um, so, yeah, it's a great explanation. I appreciate that. Um, sure. And Julie said, thanks for the response. So my pleasure, Julie. Great question. Or um, Thanks, Chris, also for your insight. So that really kind of kind of wraps us up here. I'd like to um, you know wrap up with a few closing thoughts and then jump to a few more questions. Um, so really just kind of recapping, um, the five things we covered, really, design matters. Um, you know, make sure that you really invest in, in great design. Uh, make sure you're publishing regular educational content, usually in the form of a blog. That's a great way to to really uh, increase your website traffic, search engine, optimization, social media, so much good stuff there. Uh, plan for good usability, uh, prioritize well, uh, make sure you're thinking of calls to action, and then do not ignore mobile. Make sure you optimize for, for mobile experience. Um, so with that, um, again, I'd love to open up to questions. Um, I actually see a couple more here, so let me get those questions here. Uh, one question, this is uh, from James. James asks, how often should I blog? Um, I don't know, Chris, what you think, but I, I say at least once a week is a good schedule. Uh, we blog twice a week at SpinWeb and occasionally more, but I really like to see at least minimum once a week. Uh, that's kind of a good schedule. So uh, what, what do you do, Chris? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, the bare minimum, um, and I wish I met that. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't meet that as much. So even the, the traffic arc you've seen in the, uh, for the amount of content we have, it's, it's, not, it's not once a week from a blog standpoint between the news the news module and the blog module, we probably get, you know, we probably get there once a week from some sort of, of content updating the site. Um, the, the blog is not as much. Uh, we definitely do some things with video as well that, that helps out uh, on that standpoint. Um, but it's one of those things where you can have, you can never have too much content on your site. I mean, you could perhaps post too many blog articles to social networks. You know, you could really inundate your followers um, streams with, with with information on social sites, but as far as a, a website goes and blogging, you can never have too much good uh, blog content. So basically, as much as your heart desires, I would say go for it. But at, yeah, I would say at a bare minimum, um, once a week. Nice, nice. Uh, another question here from uh, Joyce um, for Flexback. For you, for you Chris, uh, what is uh, Flexback's geographic customer base? Like, I guess she's asking me, how are you national? How how far out do you focus in terms of customer base? Sure, sure. That's that's a great question. Actually, as it pertains to to web traffic. Um, so we are our headquarters are here in Indianapolis. Um, we have a warehouse with staff up in Elkhart, Indiana, which is northwestern Indiana. Um, just a couple hour and a half outside of Chicago, and then we also have a location over in the Quad Cities. Uh, it's actually in Rock Island, Illinois, which is right on the Illinois-Iowa border. For those of you familiar with that area, um, and, and we basically hit a couple hundred miles uh, radius of each of those locations with our delivery trucks. Uh, we we definitely, you know, being in distribution, um, you know, delivered product is something that you know we, we like to be able to handle on our own. We have lots of customers that have, you know, certain needs that, you know, deliver in a certain area or, you know, real short time frames. So relying on national carriers is difficult for us. Um, so we don't have a really far reach from, from that standpoint. And that's good and bad. It allows us to kind of to, to do some targeting with, you know, making sure our, our website headers and all of our um, geolocation things are in there. So we really can show up easier for localized searches. Um, it's also difficult from the standpoint that we do get quite a bit of web traffic um, from just all over the country and frankly international as well that we can provide them information and we you know we may be able to service them but we don't stand as good a chance of, of providing solutions for them that fit into their budget as opposed to more of our um, regional customers so we, we definitely see traffic from a national standpoint and that's and that actually really speaks to the value of blog um, blog updating where we show up for fairly generic search phrases on a national standpoint where you would think there would be somebody closer um, that would show up higher in the search rankings than we do but there's just not a lot of people in the space that that do any um, normal you know, website content updating so we we do a fair amount of, of traffic from all over the nation thanks Chris great insights um, sure. 
Looks like that's, uh, that's all our questions for now. We're about to wrap up here, but um, I want to point out that, of course, our contact information is on screen there. Uh, Chris and I are both extremely active online. Uh, we try to be as helpful as possible to anyone that uh, would like to reach 